Chapter 61, It's Been a Long, Long Time New York City, New York July 12, 2009, 1133H Local Are you going to be okay? The guy with the eye patch said. Yeah. Yeah. Steve answered while looking around at his surroundings. I just, I had a date. He added. The gravity of the situation finally hit the first Avenger. He couldn't believe that some part of him would rather die in the ice than be found now. Everything that he was seeing was new and familiar at the same time, the crowd, the buildings, the cars. Everything was just so disconcerting. Only his training and experience kept him from freaking out. We should get in the car. I can't answer the questions you obviously have while we're still out in the open. The man advised. Some people would usually just follow that suggestion, but the captain was not just anyone. He would not just trust anyone even if he was technically in the States. He turned around and faced the man. You don't expect me to just follow you anywhere, do you? Steve stated while looking at the man suspiciously. God, I hope not. The man replied with a chuckle. But you should know that you have no other option for now. I can say that I'm part of a US-based agency. The man added while flashing his badge. Steve ran multiple scenarios in his mind to see what was the best course of action, and he decided that there really was only one vi viable thing he could do right now. Of course, he could fight his way out right now, but he would indeed get recaptured due to his lack of intel. If he gets into the car now, he could still fight his way out if things were to go south. He nodded towards the man to show that he would follow for now. The man walked towards the black car behind him and opened the car's back door. Steve warily walked towards the car. The man got in on the other side of the vehicle after he closed the door. He confirmed that the agents were trained and coordinated since the cars quickly lined up into a convoy as they started moving. I'm Nick Fury, the director for the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, or SHIELD, your namesake. The man now named Fury introduced himself. Steve couldn't help but focus on the name of the agency Fury said he was a part of, but he pushed the thoughts about it away for now. We are a US-based international agency focused on dealing with the, weird, aspect of the world. Fury explained. The car drove under the same building that he had just escaped from. For now, we're going to a series of medical tests on you to make sure everything is a-okay. Steve just listened to Fury talk. He was still not sure if he was safe for now, but at least he was confident that they would not suddenly aim their guns at him. Nevertheless, he was still keeping track of everything he could use as a weapon. The cars parked near the door and Fury got out of the vehicle. Steve copied what Fury did and followed the director. He noticed that the agents kept some distance from him and were making sure that he was not getting crowded. As he was nearing what he guessed was the medical center, evident by the white room with multiple machines, he decided to ask a question that's been plaguing his mind since the moment he woke up. Can you answer a question for me? Steve said. Sure, as long as it's not classified. Fury replied. You don't exactly have your clearance back. Steve agreed to Fury's statement, but what he was curious about shouldn't be classified. Do you know what happened to Agent Margaret Elizabeth Carter? Steve asked, making sure to use her full name. Fury fully expected this question to come. Director Carter's and the captain's tragic romance story was well known by everyone. Hell, some production companies even tried to make a movie out of it. The production plans only stopped due to Director Carter's sensitive career history. Fury had already planned on how to approach the topic. Former Director Carter was one of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. She obviously became the previous director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury stated, hoping that he could soften the blow. She retired almost eight years ago. For years ago, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's.
Steve felt a sense of dread washing over him. She died on November 20, 2007, at a Royal Air Force base in Alconbury, UK. Steve stopped in the middle of the hallway when he heard what Fury had said. Steve continued to stand in the middle of the hallway, trying to absorb what he had heard. New York City, New York July 13, 2009, 0500H Local This is a restored 1950s boxing gym. We bought this place two days after we found you. Fury stated while walking around the old school gym. One of my guys had this place restored and placed a fully functioning apartment on the top floor. He added. Fury had to give it to Carlson. The gym was looking good. There are three agents next door who are going to monitor you for at least three months. Steve waved off what Fury said. He was too busy looking over the place. He noticed that there were those mini cameras mounted, mounted in the corners of the ceiling. Shield really was deadest on keeping an eye on him. I'm going to leave you to it. Fury said before walking towards the exit when Steve didn't give him a reply. Just press on the big red button in each room if or when you need anything. Your briefing schedule is on the table in the dining room upstairs. Fury had arranged a series of meetings with some agents to teach and guide Captain Rogers through modern society. They would focus on everything that could help Captain Rogers adapt faster, like modern technology, finance, modern history, current affairs, and social norms. Modern warfare, tactics, and training reconditioning would happen after the previous plan. Fury's goal was for the captain to be mission ready in six months. Maybe a year at the most. Fury subtly checked that the agents he had assigned to this mission were not undercover Hydra agents. However, he could never be 100% certain unless he did something drastic like strapping them to his lie detector or contacting Naruto, and God knows that he doesn't have to deal with that right now. Fury, before you go. Steve called out as Fury was walking towards the door. Where's my shield? He asked. If there was one thing you could use to symbolize Captain America, it was the red, white, and blue vibranium shield. It had been with him ever since he officially started to do missions. He routinely used it both offensively and defensively. Of course, he had formed an emotional attachment to the shield. Well, about that. Fury started sheepishly. We did find your shield, but one of my individual contractors borrowed it while you were still in a coma. Steve raised his eyebrow. He liked to think that he could read people well enough and according to his reading, Fury would not trust people not in his own organization, especially with something as important as a shield made from a rare metal. He was supposed to bring it back a week after he borrowed it. I'm going to try to make contact with him so he can bring it back. Steve just nodded, dropped his bag beside the staircase, and placed his leather jacket on top. He chose clothes from Shield's wide selection. He had chosen five casual clothes, three home clothes, a brown leather jacket, and a tactical suit just in case. Fury left the building when he saw Captain Rogers walking towards the punching bag. Understandably, he would like to release some stress after the day that he has had. Hell, from Rogers' perspective, everything from fighting Red Skull to waking up in the 21st century happened within a week. Steve heard the automatic door lock engaging. He knew that there were more than three agents monitoring him. From his observation, at least half of the people in the neighborhood were agents. However, he just didn't have the energy to do something about it. Maybe in the future, he might care about it, but not now, not after the week that he has had. He settled into a standard boxing stance and started pounding the punching bag, releasing all of his frustration into the bag. It didn't take long for the punching bag to start swinging wildly. He stopped when he noticed that the bag was about to rip. Steve grabbed hold of the bag to steady it and started taking some deep calming breaths. He didn't even feel winded with that short exercise due to the super soldier serum. You need someone to steady that for you? 
Steve suddenly heard someone ask. Steve quickly turned towards the direction of the voice and went into his fighting stance. He saw a man sitting on the ropes of the boxing ring closest to him. The blonde man was wearing a burnt orange shirt with blue jeans. However, the most noticeable thing about the man was the animal-like whiskers on his cheeks. Who are you? Steve asked threateningly. The gym itself was supposed to be a secure location, so how did someone sneak inside? I have a bone to pick with Fury. I'm not one of his independent contractors. I just happen to have a closer working relationship with him than other agencies. The man said before he jumped off the rope. Steve went on high alert as the man walked towards him. He surmised that he was the one that had borrowed his shield. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Information broker, mercenary, and overall badass. The man introduced himself. What are you doing here? Steve asked while still not dropping his fighting stance. I'm here to return this to you. Naruto said as he retrieved something from behind him. Of course, Steve was shocked when Naruto pulled out his shield, seemingly out of nowhere, and tossed it towards him. He caught the shield and quickly inspected it before placing it on his arm. I'm also here to talk to you about something. I guarantee that you will like to hear what I'm going to say. Naruto stated confidently. Just a warning, somebody's listening in on our conversation. Shield? Steve said quietly. Hell, nah. Naruto countered. I already hacked their feed. They have no idea that I'm even here. He added with a chuckle. The person listening in now has a more personal stake in this conversation. Steve had no idea what hacking meant, but he assumed that it was something impressive. He wouldn't admit it, but he was interested in what this Naruto wanted to talk about. Although, he was still not dropping his guard. Naruto walked towards the bench press and sat on it. He took out a hot cup of ramen from who knows where and started eating. Steve looked at Naruto incredulously, not expecting this, this turn of events. You want some? Naruto offered, to which Steve shook his head no. I'll write more for me. He continued before taking a sip of the soup. Before we start, I need you to remember that we are living in some weird times. You understand? Sure. Steve quickly replied, wanting to move forward with the conversation. First of all, you should be wary of everyone around you. Not everyone who acts as your friend is actually your friend. Naruto started. I can't tell you what I'm talking about until you're used to the 21st century, but I can tell you some names you can trust in S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury, Maria Hill, Natasha Romanoff, Clint Barton, Phil Coulson, and Sharon Carter. It's your choice if you're going to believe me. One name quickly got Steve's attention. Sharon Carter? Steve asked. Got that, didn't you? Naruto said with a grin. Grand niece of Peggy Carter herself. Tenacious girl, that one. Followed her in aunt's footsteps even against her mother's wishes. Steve couldn't help but smile when he heard Naruto's description of Sharon Carter. It looked like Peggy still lived one way or another. Thinking about Peggy brought down his mood, though. Peggy Carter never married. Some people thought that she was focused on her job, but most people agree that she just couldn't move on from her first romance. Naruto stated. Apparently, a guy that didn't even show up on a date. Steve had no idea why Naruto was telling him this, but he winced when he heard about the Miss Dance. If he was the kind of person who cursed, he would be spouting a storm towards the Red Skull. Her love story was almost made into a movie. Why are you telling me this? Cause, Peggy Carter is still alive. Naruto said with a mischievous grin. Steve quickly faced Naruto with wide eyes. Can you say, say that again? Steve asked pleadingly. 
It would be one of the cruelest jokes ever made if it was not true. Got your attention now, right? Naruto replied, still with his grin. There are some extenuating circumstances that can't be talked about right now, but the bottom line is that Peggy is still alive. You want to meet her? Steve was shouting at himself to say yes, but it was like he couldn't find his voice. It was like everything that had been happening to him in the past two days had finally caught up with him. The psychological and emotional strain had rendered him speechless at the most crucial moment. Well, it looks like you don't want to. See you around, I guess. Naruto said teasingly, but Steve couldn't detect the sarcasm causing him to panic. Naruto was starting to leave when Steve saw a boxing glove hit the back of Naruto's head. Steve followed the path where the glove had come from and saw an image straight from a dream. Peggy Carter had been listening in on Naruto and Steve's conversation from the apartment upstairs. She and Naruto had sneaked inside the building after the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents did a sweep before Steve and Fury arrived. Naruto just set the feeds on a loop in the apartment before they arrived, effectively showing the room as empty. Most of the time, Peggy appreciated Naruto's joking nature, but now was definitely not the time. She couldn't believe that she had agreed to let Naruto be the one to soften the blow since anyone else was better than the guy whose default setting was to prank everyone. That was why she had to step in when Naruto went too far. Steve was looking at her with both disbelief and love. Peggy didn't even know how she identified those two emotions, but she would take it regardless. She walked down the stairs and sauntered towards Steve until they were only a few feet away from each other. It took a few more moments before Steve was finally able to do anything. He reached towards Peggy's face and ran his thumb across her, her cheeks, making sure that it wasn't a dream. Peggy unconsciously leaned into Steve's touch. How? Steve croaked out. How what? Peggy interjected. How is this possible? Don't get me wrong, I'm ecstatic that you're alive but why are you still young? Steve amended his question. Are you saying that I'm old? Peggy said with a raised eyebrow. We're both old. Steve countered, which caused Peggy to chuckle. Peggy looked behind Steve and gestured towards Naruto. Steve followed her line of sight and his sight went towards Naruto. Naruto visited me in my hospital suite one day, and gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. Peggy started. He told me that he knew that you were still alive, but since I was basically dying, he offered me a deal. I was going to be his final test dummy for an experimental procedure that he created. It would basically make me younger and make me into pseudo super soldier. He knew I was still alive. How? Steve inquired with disbelief. He's weird. You'll know more in the future. Peggy answered with a smile. Hey. I'm not weird. I'm unique. Naruto interjected, but it just fell on deaf ears. Peggy walked into Steve's arms and hugged him, which he reciprocated. You know, you still owe me a dance, Peggy stated. This brought a smile to Steve's face. I know. Steve replied. We should probably reschedule for after Fury releases me from my house arrest. Hearing Fury's name reminded to Peggy of something she should warn Steve about. Speaking of Fury, you can't tell anyone that I'm still alive, or that you have already met Naruto. Peggy instructed. Why? I'm not going to tell you right now. You should use your downtime to adjust and enjoy your time. Peggy replied. We're going to tell you in the future, so you shouldn't worry about it for now. Now. Steve just nodded. He was going to push all the problems onto his future self and just enjoy the moment right now. Peggy? Naruto called out. Just call me if you need to go. I need to take care of something. He said as his own way to give some privacy to the reacquainted couple.
Peggy flashed him a smile before resting her head back into Steve's chest. Naruto pulled out a speaker from his storage seal and set it up. He started It's Been a Long, Long Time by Harry James and Helen Forrest before he hirishined away. The last thing he saw was Steve and Peggy slow dancing to the music. Chapter 62, Taking a Break, that's the title. Natasha's Safe House, New York City. November 07, 2009, 0800 H Local. Four months. It has been four months since Captain Rogers woke up and met with the love of his life. Honestly, Naruto thought that Steve would somehow blow Peggy's cover, just basing it on his Boy Scout attitude. Naruto had seriously underestimated the captain's acting abilities since Fury thought that Steve was still depressed underneath everything. Fury's plan to educate Steve on modern society has been going well. Although Naruto had to fix up some stuff to make sure everything went smoothly. Flashback start. Fury was currently in his underground office in Washington, D.C. This was where he did his sensitive work like the plans regarding Hydra and the Avengers Initiative. Only Maria Hill knew about his hideout, but he was sure that Naruto knew about it, and if Naruto knew about it, then you could expect Romanoff to know about it as well. What Fury was doing right now was double-checking all the reports that he had gathered about the agents that he sent to tutor the captain. He was grateful that he was now aware that Hydra was growing inside S.H.I.E.L.D., so the work that he needed to put in instantly tripled. He needed to check every person that he, he interacts with, create appropriate reasons to push out the Hydra operatives, and figure out which projects he could afford to be compromised, all without Hydra figuring out what he was doing. Fury was still checking the reports when Naruto showed up. He didn't even show an ounce of surprise with Naruto's magic trick since he had seen it too many times for it to invoke any emotion. Naruto must have seen it too since he frowned when he noticed Fury's lack of reaction. You're no fun anymore. Naruto said before sitting down on the chair in front of the table. Good to know that I'm just a source of entertainment for you. Fury blandly replied. He took another look at the reports before placing them down and looking at Naruto. I need the shield back. What shield? Naruto asked acting innocent. I don't have time for this. Where is it? Geez. What had got your panties in a bunch? Naruto commented. I think Cap already has it since I left it there a few hours after you dropped him off. You already met him? In person? Nah, I got no interest in a man with no sense of humor. Naruto answered. I watched him few times, not creepily of course. He added with a grin. Fury knew that in the past two days Captain Rogers was in the gym slash apartment slash safe house, there were no external contacts except for his agents. However, he also knew that the surveillance camera feeds could be tampered with, but he couldn't do anything against it unless he placed an agent by Captain's side at all times. I noticed the agent rotation schedule. What's your plan with that? Naruto asked like he had no idea what plan Fury had cooked up. Fury had already figured out that Naruto was just acting, but he played along with it regardless to see what Naruto was getting at. The guy came from the 40s. I can't consider him an asset unless he adapts to the current times. Fury explained. Asset, huh? Naruto mused. I'm not sure you will be able to use him in your standard espionage missions. He's a leader and a fighter. He added. You might be able to use him in search, search and retrieval, extraction, short insertions, and maybe, the welcome wagon. I know that. Fury grumbled. Pretty useless since S.H.I.E.L.D. only does a few high-value missions of those types. Anyways, that's not what I'm here for and it's your problem. Naruto replied. I want to see which agents you chose as the captain's guides. So it's Hydra, huh? Fury let out. Fury picked up the report summary with the list of six agents, 
that had been given the assignment and gave it to Naruto. Naruto took the list and looked it over. You did a great job of screening the agents. Too bad you didn't check deep enough. Naruto's statement caused Fury to frown. Every one of these dudes and Didettes are deep undercover Hydra agents. What? Yup. From what I can tell, the first two were recruited before they joined S.H.I.E.L.D., while the last four were recruited inside the academy. Naruto replied. Just think of it like this, 40% of every agent's below 6th level clearance has some Hydra influence on them. 60% of anyone 6 and above. At least that's what I got from checking 80% of your personnel. Fury couldn't help but slam his head down on the table. He knew that Hydra had a lot had a lot of pull inside of S.H.I.E.L.D., but hearing some concrete figures made the task of cleaning up S.H.I.E.L.D. a lot more daunting. Hydra literally has S.H.I.E.L.D. by the ropes. Anything less than a complete purge and rebuild would cause S.H.I.E.L.D. to be taken over again. What would it take for me to see that list? Fury asked with a slight hint of desperation. You're not going to see my list anytime soon. Naruto answered quickly. Set everything you can for now before worrying about what to do with HYDRA. He stood up from his chair, retrieved a piece of paper from his pocket, and tossed it on Fury's table. These are the agents that I would recommend you to use. It's your choice on how you're going to play it so that Hydra has no idea what you're doing. Fury took the paper and pocketed it. He was going to check it later, right after he had few fingers of bourbon. Naruto didn't stay long and left Fury to deal with the mess. Flashback end. Naruto was thinking back on the events that had happened in the last four months when the door opened, revealing an irate Natasha. He would have chuckled when he saw Nat looking like a frazzled secretary, but a stern glare from her effectively stopped him. Good morning, Haim. Naruto greeted with a charming smile, but Nat ignored him and went straight to the couch. How was work? Nat automatically groaned when she heard the question. I just got a promotion. Natasha replied while kicking off her heels. It's horrible. That two statements don't exactly work together. You know that right? Naruto said with a raised eyebrow. It works if your boss is Justin Hammer, and he promoted you as one of his personal assistants. Natasha countered. Naruto gave his full attention when he heard what Natasha had said. He stopped monitoring Natasha and Jessica after they requested for him to stop. In return, they would have a Horatian seal on them at all times. That was why he had no idea what was happening with Nat at work and Jess at college. He's a young Tony Stark copycat cranked up to a hundred. I think he just promoted me just to get a chance to get in my pants. He didn't do something, did he? Naruto asked in a low tone. Nat immediately noticed Naruto's change in tone. She turned towards him and saw a distinct difference. Naruto's irises had changed into something more feral, more fox-like. His whiskers were more pronounced. There was also an oppressive aura coming off of him. She placed her hand on his arm to calm him down. If Naruto's aura broke through the seals that he placed around the apartment, people who experienced his atmosphere would feel suffocated. Some might even straight up die. Solts, calm down. Nothing happened. Natasha said with a soothing voice. He tried to make something happen, but nothing did. I can handle myself. Worst come to the worst, I'll just break some bones and get myself fired. Naruto visibly started to calm down after hearing Natasha's statement. His aura receded and his eyes turned back to his usual blue. He grabbed a hold of Nat's waist, pulled her up to his lap, and took some deep calming breaths. Tell me again why did Fury assign you this mission? Naruto questioned while burying his head in Nat's hair. Natasha leaned towards Naruto's body, just enjoying the moment. 
Fury got some info that Hammer was doing some questionable moves. Natasha answered. Corporate espionage on Stark Industries, shorting of contracts, and black market sales. Just like Stain. Damn. Is every arms dealer just a power-hungry asshole? Naruto mused. Well, Tony is just an asshole most of the time. He added with a chuckle which Natasha mirrored. That sounds right. Natasha agreed. Have I told you how Hammer is pulling his hair out recently? Are you going to tell me why? Natasha turned around and mounted Naruto, facing him, while flashing a mesmerizing smile. Everyone in the industry hoped that Tony would completely dismantle his weapons manufacturing division after he temporarily suspended its operation. Natasha replied. Instead, Stark Industries returned stronger than ever, focusing on underutilized markets like body armor, reconnaissance, weapon systems, and communications. Tony almost went through with his plan to close the weapons manufacturing division and just focus on the consumer market, specifically clean energy. Pepper and Naruto were the ones who changed Tony's mind. Pepper concentrated on the political and corporate aspects of his decision, decision like broken contracts, lawsuits, decreased cash flow, employee layoffs, and corporate restructuring. All of which would significantly impact the company. Naruto focused on the technological innovations and alternate options like focusing on defensive loadout instead of the weapons themselves and stricter weapon tracking and control. What about the whole Iron Man fiasco? Natasha's demeanor turned sour when she heard Naruto's inquiry. That's a whole other beast entirely. Natasha started. A bunch of CEOs of weapons manufacturing companies banded together, led by Justin Hammer himself, and lobbied for the U.S. government to take Tony's suit. It has just started, but it's quickly gaining traction. So that's what they've been doing. Naruto murmured, but Natasha heard it. Who's doing what? Naruto snapped from his musing and stared back at Natasha's green eyes. Hydra has been moving some pieces. They are doubling down. Bribing, blackmail, and calling in favors. Naruto explained. I thought they were preparing for the takeover, but it didn't really fit with the timeline, but if their goal is to get their hands on Tony's suit, it fits a whole lot better. Natasha had no real idea about Hydra's movement. If it weren't for Naruto, she wouldn't even be aware that Hydra was inside S.H.I.E.L.D. She wouldn't even be affected by H.Y.D.R.A., unless it was time for their takeover, since she was more of a field operative. A lot less drama and backstabbing than the administration. What are you going to do about it? Natasha asked. Nothing. Nothing? Yeah. Hydra will not be able to move in the light. They can only do backroom deals and underhanded tactics. It can do a lot but not as much as they would like. Naruto continued. Besides, if Tony can make the US government back down in an attempt to get his tech, then there won't be any more blatant moves in the future, and he will have solidified his hold on his suit. And if he bombs it, or the unexpected happens. Then I bomb the suit, or I guess melting it down is the better option. Naruto contemplated before focusing back to the topic at hand. They wouldn't even know I did it so it's the perfect crime. Can you imagine Hydra grunts wearing a fully functioning Iron Man suit? He added while releasing a fake shiver. Natasha got off of Naruto and walked towards the kitchen. She retrieved a glass, filled it from the tap before drinking it. She was feeling a little famished, so she decided to look for some food. We got any leftovers? Natasha asked. Yeah. There's some pizza in the fridge. Naruto answered before standing up. I'm going to heat it up. Just relax for now. Natasha flashed Naruto a grateful smile and kissed him before moving towards the couch. By the way, Tony is going to start looking for a bodyguard slash assistant for Pepper anytime now. 
he said while putting the pizza in the microwave with a glass of water. He's going to hire an assistant for his assistant? Natasha countered incredulously. Pepper is going to retire in December after their wedding. Naruto replied while bracing himself on the counter. Why December? Tony is going to get married on December 16th. Same day as his parents died. Naruto started. He wants to replace the memory of that day with something better. Natasha looked at Naruto weirdly, which caused him to chuckle. I know, right? I can't believe he has something like that in him. The microwave stopped a few seconds after he finished talking. Naruto took the pizza and placed it on the center table. He took a slice and sat down next to Natasha. Why are you telling me this, anyway? Because I want you to tell Fury about it. Just imagine what could happen if you took on that assignment. Naruto is practically vibrating with the prospect. Wow. You're really excited about this, huh? Natasha commented with a smirk. All right, I'll ask Fury about it. She added before remembering something. How's the captain and Peggy doing? They're doing great. Naruto answered with a grin. I had to sneak them out of that safe house eight times last month alone for their, their dates. I have an extended break next week. We should go on a date. Natasha suggested, to which Naruto agreed wholeheartedly. Bogota, Colombia. November 23rd, 2009, 1800 H Local. Naruto and Eric were currently staying in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. The mission Naruto chose this time? The systematic disassembly of a drug cartel that has a side business in human trafficking, who was rapidly working up their way up the ladder. By systematic, he means wiping out the whole cartel. Eric was cleaning his gear when he heard Naruto walk into the room. So, three months left before the return of the prodigal son. What's your plan after this? Naruto asked. Eric froze in his seat. He had honestly forgot about that small fact. The monthly missions kind of made him forgot about his plan to take over Wakanda and forcefully change the world order. He looked up at Naruto who was leaning on the door frame. I have no idea. Eric admitted while unconsciously reaching for the Kamoyo beads that he was currently using as a necklace while it wasn't yet complete. I will probably still head to Wakanda. What are you going to do after you arrive? We'll see. Eric replied before fixing up his loadout. Naruto was kind of stuck with his plan now. He couldn't get an accurate read of Eric's thoughts. As far as he could tell, it could go 50-50. Eric could just join the Golden Tribe as a war dog or force a royal upheaval. He would need to deal with the problem if everything goes south. Naruto decided to just move on to the current mission. He retrieved a hollow projector and placed it on the ground. The projector showed an accurate map of Bogota and its surrounding area. Eric stood up and approached the projected map. Naruto manipulated the map to focus on a mansion southeast of the city. This is the final mission area. After we deal with some cash houses and safe house in and out of the city, we're going to raise the whole place down after retrieving everything of value. Naruto explained before showing the whole map again. This time, multiple red dots appeared on the map. We're going to hit every one of these places tonight before heading to the final mission area. Our goal is to end everything before the sun rises tomorrow. Any questions? Eric just shook his head negative. Naruto retrieved a smartphone and gave it to Eric. That thing has map of every place that you're going to hit. We'll head out in two hours. Chapter 63, One Problematic Wedding Stark Mansion, Long Island, New York December 16th 2009, 1900 H Local. I think the tie doesn't match the suit. Tony said nervously as he was fixing up his tie. 
It's a black tie with a black suit. There's nothing better that could match that. Rody retorted while trying to keep his calm. Maybe a gray tie would be better. Give it a bit of variety. Tony replied. Or maybe something more colorful. A rainbow tie, perhaps. Just to give some color. He added while still fixing up his tie. If someone was observing the pair, they would most likely see Rody's eyebrow twitching. I should probably change my shoes too. This statement finally snapped Rody's patience. He grabbed hold of Tony's shoulders and shook him a bit. Tony. Your tie's fine. Your shoes are fine. Just settle down. Down. Rody shouted before taking a deep breath to calm down. Everything's fine. We checked, double checked, and triple checked. Nothing will happen. Okay? Tony stared at Rody weirdly for a few moments before his expression turned more contemplative. You realize that you just jinxed the whole thing, right? Tony said seriously, causing Rody's face to scrunch up. Jinxes aren't real. I have a dimensional hopping demigod as one of my groomsmen. I think jinxes are a lot more believable. Tony countered a matter-of-factly. A few weeks ago, Naruto decided to come clean to both of Tony's friends about who he really was. He felt that he trusted them enough for them to learn more about him. To say the duo was surprised was an understatement. Touché. Tony visibly got a lot calmer as he and Rody conversed. They decided to just pour a finger of bourbon for each of them, while waiting for someone to call them. I never imagined you getting married, or at least getting married before me. Rody let out with a small chuckle. I'm not that bad. One of your favorite quotes in college was the more, the merrier, and that only applies to chicks. Rody countered. Tony had the audacity to act offended. I was just doing my gentlemanly duty. Who knows what would have happened if I just left them on their own. Tony replied jokingly, causing the pair to release a series of laughs. As their laughs died down, Rody decided to tackle the one duty that the best man has. Tony. Rody called out, causing Tony to turn towards him. Last chance to back out, man. You can still push this back or cancel it altogether. Pepper would understand if you got cold, cold feet. To be completely honest, Rody would hate for Tony to suddenly have cold feet. Aside from the commotion that it would cause, he was not looking forward to Pepper's reaction. She would completely understand Tony's position, but it would definitely affect her on some level. Some women are going to rage when they hear that their fiancé was getting cold feet, but Pepper is too classy for that. Tony got a contemplative look on his face. He would never burn his chance to marry Pepper right here and now, but you could forgive the guy for thinking deeply about taking one of the most significant steps in his life. Even now, he couldn't believe how much he loves Pepper. He would never get caught getting lovey-dovey in public since he still had an image to maintain. You know, I'm just going to go through with it. The wedding costs too much to back out now. Tony replied sarcastically. Somebody knocked on the door a few seconds after it. Doors open. Happy peeked inside the room and looked at the duo sitting on the couch. He was wearing a light gray suit which was the dress code decided by Tony and Pepper. They decided on a simple theme, black and white. The bride would obviously wear a white gown. The maid of honor would be wearing an ivory-colored dress, while the bridesmaids would be wearing off-white, all of them made by Renee Strauss. Tony swore that there was no difference in those colors. The groom would be wearing a black suit, while the best man and groomsman would be wearing gray suits, with the best man wearing a darker color. The suits were designed by Giorgio Armani. Ten minutes. Happy informed them. Great, I'm getting tired of waiting. Tony said before standing up and heading straight to the door. Rody and Happy walked beside him towards the wedding proper, 
which was in the vast area behind the mansion. Tony had rarely used the mansion ever since his parents died. Died, but it seems fitting to be in this place when his life's direction changes again. Besides, with his decision to do the wedding on the day of his parents' death, doing the wedding at the mansion seemed like a no-brainer. Did we encounter any problems? Tony asked, making sure he could fix anything unforeseen while he still could. Happy grimaced when he heard the question which Tony saw. Come on, Happy. Spit it out. Ugh. Where to start? Happy let out, which was never a good sign. The caterer got stuck in traffic. The flowers wilted along the way. The lights somehow short-circuited. You know the usual. He drawled on, trying to play down the gravity of the situation. Tony stopped in the middle of the hallway and stared at Happy dumbfoundedly. Why the hell are we still going through with this then? Tony asked, getting a lot more serious. Well, Naruto came through. Happy answered. It was a lot harder to hide him doing stuff, though. Tony released a sigh of relief when he heard Happy's answer. So, what did he do? Naruto started by doing that cloning thing and changing into a lot of different guys. Still weirds me out every time I see it. Happy started. He took over the three kitchens and started cooking a bunch of stuff. Naruto didn't even use the ingredients in the kitchen. He just kept pulling stuff out of nowhere. At least the theme became around the world cuisine, so we got that going for us. Damn. Tony commented, visibly impressed. How long did cook, and how much did he prepare? Two hours and more than ten times the original amount. Happy replied. I have no idea how Naruto cooked all of it since a lot of those foods take a long time to cook. He even made some meals that take a whole day to prepare. What the hell? Rody exclaimed. Never mind that, for now. How'd he fix the plant and light problem? Naruto went to the back garden and created a bunch of flowers. Flowers. The plants just sprouted from the ground. Happy explained. He still couldn't believe that Naruto did it even though he was there. As for the lights, he pulled out some glass balls that emit on the directional light and float. Tony immediately got interested in the lights that Naruto created. It sounded like the perfect lighting device, especially for decoration and search and rescue missions. Did he say how he made it? Tony asked. Something about seals and chakra battery. I have no idea how he did it. Happy said honestly. The trio finally reached the wedding proper. Tony and Rody were impressed by the current setup. The wedding planner only helped arrange the wedding and coordinate all the different things needed, but the planner herself was not at the wedding. Tony and Pepper decided to have a small wedding. Like 20 people only, including the judge officiating. Tony basically said fuck it and didn't invite anyone except for close friends and family. Tony will probably host a public event in the future, but for now, this wedding is just theirs. The trio could see that everyone was already at their seats. On the right were Tony's friends and family. His only representative for the family side was Morgan. Pepper's friends and family were on the left side. Her father, mother, and two sisters came. Mr. Jonathan Potts was a retired federal judge from Virginia. He fully expected Pepper to be a lawyer, so he was shocked when she decided to enter business school. He was Tony's number one critique due to Tony's previous lifestyle, but it all turned around after Morgan was born. It was almost the same narrative for Mrs. Veronica Potts, who was a chief of medicine. Tony looked around a bit more before walking towards Pepper's parents while greeting their guests on the way there. He shook Jonathan's hand and gave Veronica a peck on the cheek. Did I miss anything? Tony asked like his usual self, but a bit more respectful. He really didn't want to piss off his not-so-future father-in-law. Not much. Jonathan replied with a shrug. 
though one of your groomsmen was still fixing some stuff until a few minutes ago. Which one and what did he do? The tall blonde one. Jonathan answered. He carried in those decorative Corinthian pillars and ark. Tony turned his head toward the podium and saw the white pillars and the ark Veronica was talking about. He almost choked when he saw what those pillars were. A few years back, Tony decided to donate a few million dollars to the Greek government because he watched Hercules while drunk. As a show of gratitude, the Greeks gave him a few pieces of stuff, like statues, and a whole facade of a decrepit temple. He had no idea where to put it, so he placed it in the basement storage. Basically, Naruto carried some four-ton pillars in front of everyone, and no one questioned it. He could even see the posts embedded on the ground. Why the hell would Naruto expose himself like that? You okay, honey? Veronica asked in a concerned tone. The question snapped Tony out of his mini panic. He shook his head a bit and recentered himself. Yeah, yeah. Just surprised by how good it looks. Tony lied. It looks like he didn't lie smoothly enough since Jonathan was looking at him weirdly. Good thing he was saved by Happy approaching the trio. Mr. Potts, can you proceed to the staging area? We are five minutes away. Happy said. Jonathan nodded and bade them goodbye before walking to the back. Tony decided to go to his position. A few moments later, Rhodey, Happy, and Naruto arrived. Classical music started playing on the speakers. Tony and Pepper decided to just let, let Jarvis play the music through the speakers accompanied by a holographic projection of a band or a symphony at the side. The holographic band was showing a symphony playing canon in D. It's showtime. Tony said to no one in particular. The wedding procession started their march. Morgan was the first in the line as the flower girl, wearing a beautiful white dress. He couldn't help but smile when he saw his daughter eagerly walking down the red carpet. Behind Morgan was a robot that was basically only an arm on tracks, carrying a pillow with the rings. This was, of course, Dummy, the first robot Tony ever built. The buggy robot was made back in the 80s. He upgraded it throughout the years, but being problematic was one of its charms. Dummy was followed by the bridesmaids, then the maid of honor. That was when Tony saw his fiery angel on earth. Pepper walked down the aisle, accompanied by her father. The pure white lace dress perfectly complemented her milky white skin. The inlaid micro diamonds refracted the light from the glow balls, making the dress shine like stars. She decided to tie her hair up while letting two strands frame her face. Tony stared at Pepper slack-jawed and wide-eyed. Good thing there were only a few guests, or he would be teased for quite a while. That is if he cared about how he looked right now. Rhodey definitely took his job as the best man seriously since he nudged Tony to bring him back. For her part, Pepper had to stifle a giggle and feel flattered seeing Tony gape at her like that. Some might ask why she wasn't feeling emotional or overwhelmed at her wedding. To that, she says, why the hell not? There were only two gears available if you were doing anything with him, and that's either excitement or contentment. She only felt bliss right now. Like the universe just wanted her to be there no matter what. If she had any idea about the problems that had happened, she would think otherwise. Jonathan and Pepper finally reached the podium, and Tony felt it isn't soon enough. Jonathan gave Pepper a peck on the cheek, cheek before giving Tony a loaded look. Tony gulped when he saw Jonathan's silent warning. Pepper opted out of using a veil, so Tony could see Pepper giving him a beautiful smile. How you doin'? Tony asked, channeling his inner Joey Tribbiani. I'm already at the altar. No need to pick me up. Pepper countered with a raised eyebrow. Nothing wrong with making sure that I can lock it down. Tony's retort caused Pepper to giggle. Anyway, let's get this wedding started. Seven years. 
You have been with me for seven years, and you still decided to marry me. I'm not saying I'm not a catch cause I'm definitely am. I'm just saying you would have to be a little crazy after seeing what I was like before, and for that, I can't ever be more thankful. You somehow changed my life, and I didn't know it was happening until I was in, hook line and sinker. Tony started his vows. He decided to just wing it and talk about what came to his mind. I promise to be less of a headache. I promise to spend less time in my workshop. He added jokingly before being a bit more serious. I will always come home to you and Morgan. I will always, always, place our family as my number one priority until the end of the line. I thought being your assistant for years was exciting, but being your girlfriend definitely took the cake. Never in a million years did I imagine that I would be marrying an immature, hyperactive, brilliant, driven. Pepper was interrupted by Naruto. Don't forget filthy rich. Naruto's comment caused a round of laughs from everyone. Yes, rich. Pepper agreed half-jokingly. Sure, you were a nightmare, but you proved to me, to everyone, that Tony Stark has a heart. She added, referencing her gift to Tony when he first changed his arc reactor. I promise to always support you even if I will worry about you. I promise to reel you back, back in when you bite off more than you can chew. I will never let you feel alone ever again. Do you, Anthony Edward Stark, take Virginia Potts, to be your wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part? The judge asked Tony. I do. Tony answered without any hint of sarcasm. Do you, Virginia Potts, take Anthony Edward Stark, to be your husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part? The judge asked Pepper this time. I. Pepper didn't get to finish her answer, because Naruto dove for the couple. Just in time, too, since the pillar right behind Pepper's head suddenly exploded. Chaos ensued, everyone scrambled to get out of the area. Rhodey and Happy quickly moved the people inside the mansion after they confirmed that Tony, Pepper, and Naruto were okay. You should suit up, Tony. We got company. Naruto suggested, but Tony and Pepper were still in some kind of shock. Why are they trying to kill her? Not me? Tony murmured to no one in particular. They are not trying to kill her. The shot was a little off, deliberately missing her by an inch or two. Naruto answered while pulling Tony and Pepper behind the pillars. Naruto's answer somehow snapped both of them out of their shock. Do you know anything about this? Tony asked Naruto, hoping someone knows about it. Not really, but I have a guess. I'll tell you when I have something concrete. Naruto answered. That was when they heard an explosion at the front of the house. Go suit up, Tony. Pecked Pepper here and everyone inside. I'll take them to the basement. Tony nodded before starting to head off, but he felt someone grabbing a hold of his wrists. He turned around and saw it was Pepper. I do. Pepper said. What? Tony let out genuinely confused. I'm saying I do. So, we're married now. Pepper continued. And since I'm your wife, I get to order you around. She added. I'm telling you to kick the asses of the assholes who ruined our wedding, but make sure you come back safe. Tony flashed a smile and nodded before going for his suit. Pepper couldn't do anything else but stare at Tony's retreating back. She only stopped when Naruto started leading her back inside the house. Damn, Pepper. Not even ten seconds into your marriage, and you already have Tony by the balls. Naruto commented, genuinely amused. Chapter 64, Miscommunication Fuck Up Hydra Forward Base, Long Island, New York December 16, 2009, 
2100H local. Hydra had been in a steep decline these past few years ever since the goddamned Ninetales decided to fuck everything up. They had to unload most of their assets and burn a lot of bridges just keep themselves afloat. They also had to go deeper underground than ever before, even deeper than when Captain America defeated the Red Skull. Communications between cells dropped by 99%, while contacts within a division dropped by 90%. They had to scrap or halt a bunch of their projects. Overall, the Nine Tails alone pushed back their plans by at least five years. The lack of communication was the number one reason why Pierce had no idea that there was an operation going on that had the probability of revealing Hydra even if it was a success. To be fair, there was the possibility of him not knowing of the operation, even if Hydra was working at 100%. The mission was headed by a different cell that operates a separate, underground science and weapons research division under Wolfgang von Strucker. He wouldn't mind the mission as much before, but Hydra was in a precari precarious situation. Pierce dropped everything the moment he heard that the Winter Soldier was thought out. He tracked down the defrost order to Strucker, as well as the mission request. Sergeant James Buchanan Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, was their oldest and most effective asset. The pseudo-super soldier had accomplished hundreds of missions over his 50-year tenure and had a success rate of just over 90%. Naturally, this high-profile asset's control was given to Pierce, one of the three leaders of HYDRA. Before the arrival of the Nine Tails, every request for the Winter Soldier's use needed to be approved by him. But with the appearance of the Nine Tails, Contact between the leaders was kept to a minimum. That's why each cell leader could thaw out the Winter Soldier as long as they completed the checklist. He really should rethink that weak-ass requirement. Pierce got out of his car after his security detail opened the door once they checked the surroundings. His security detail was made up of a shield reserve strike team. He made sure that most of the strike team, which he suggested the creation of, was made up of loyal Hydra agents. He only needed to maneuver some pieces and change the commander of the strike team to a Hydra agent, somebody like Brock Rumlow. Too bad, Rumlow was still in the military to pad up his profile. Pierce walked inside an unassuming commercial building and headed straight to the top floor while giving the receptionist a look before riding the elevator. The receptionist was obviously a Hydra agent. When he got on the top floor, he went inside the janitor's closet at the end of the hall, where he could access a secret elevator that would bring him down under the basement, where all New York operations were monitored. They had already abandoned this base due to a decrease in the number of missions done in New York, but it looked like Strucker saw fit to reopen the site. As soon as Pierce got out of the elevator, he saw a setup similar, similar to the NASA Command Center, although a lot less impressive. Twenty-five operators were monitoring each member of the attack team, including the Winter Soldier. He looked around the room to look for the man in charge of the stupid operation, but he turned towards one of his security when he didn't see him. Ask around for Strucker. I want to talk to him. Pierce ordered. The security nodded and quickly went to follow the command. Pierce went down towards the command floor leaving his security detail near the entrance, and looked for the operator that was monitoring Sergeant Barnes' vitals and head-mounted camera. The feed was showing the Winter Soldier walking up a hill through some light vegetation. He couldn't see Barnes' current loadout, but he assumed that it was a sniper rifle and an assault rifle, probably an AWM and an SA-80, just basing it on the mission parameters. Anything to report? Pierce asked the operator. Nothing, sir. Everything is going as planned. The operator answered respectfully. Pierce nodded and looked around at the other monitors to check on what was happening. He focused on three monitors, in particular, the ones where it was showing the agents rigging what he assumed was a car bomb. As Pierce was looking at the feeds, Strucker approached him. Strucker didn't greet him since convention dictates that Pierce needed to recognize Strucker's presence. After a few seconds of tense silence, Pierce started talking. 
What the hell are you thinking? Pierced asked, his irritation evident in his tone. Strucker just ignored his superior's displeasure and took a moment to answer. He already formulated his argument the instant he was notified about Pierce's arrival. Hydra is in decline. Some might think that it's just a temporary setback, but we both know that we will not survive long like this. A Hydra might survive cutting its head off and come out of it stronger, but what would happen if it starved to death? No cutting of the head there. Strucker answered. Yes, we are in decline. Pierce agreed. But what does it have to do with the mission? Power. It's always power. Isn't that the ultimate goal? Strucker replied. We want the power to rule the world. To make it better, one way or another, and for that, we need power. However, ever since that damn fox showed up, we lost much of our power. We have already started losing our hold on the underworld. Our reputation is in tatters. We are getting mocked in the shadows. He added. We need Stark's armor to force our influence back. You know that we are already in the process of acquiring it. Pierce countered, referring to the Senate committee, talking about confiscating the suit for the U.S. government. Of course, the tech would get lost in the mix, and they would get their hands on it. The committee was headed by Senator Gabriel Stern, one of their members that managed to infiltrate higher in the government. Either way, it's your job to make something like that. Who says we don't have the prototype? Strucker retorted, sounding proud. It was only two months ago when we upgraded Sergeant Barnes' prosthetic, so we are certain that we can build at least some parts of the extremities. He explained. The problem is that we have no idea how to miniaturize the actuators and hydraulics enough to allow someone inside. It's more like a robot at this point. Aside from that, we have no idea how to produce enough power to power everything. Even Sergeant Barnes' prosthetic can only last last for half an hour of heavy use before it needs to recharge, and the arm has a lot less power requirement compared to a whole suit of armor. That still doesn't answer the question of why did you order the Winter Soldier to kidnap Virginia Potts? We don't need the attention right now. If the original plan goes off without a hitch, we will have the armor by next year. Pierce said, his tone heating up. We only get it if we succeed. If it fails, Stark will only solidify his ownership of the suit, and we can't make any plays so soon after the hearing since it could directly lead back to us. Strucker replied, keeping his calm. But if my plan succeeds, we can have the suit now, and we won't have to use what little political clout we have left to get the suit from the military. If it fails, we still have your plan to get it by next year. As for why do it at their wedding? It's simple really, they dropped their security at the house down to a minimum. Strucker reasoned. Of course, there's a chance that it could reveal us, but it's a risk we have to take. Pierce stared at Strucker. His mind ran a thousand miles a second, assessing the situation while taking into account what Strucker just said. After a few moments, Pierce seemingly decided on something. Let's see what happens. Pierce stated ominously. For now, give me a rundown of what they're going to do. As you know, Stark and Potts are having their wedding today. Strucker said while ignoring Pierce's subtle threat. Sergeant Barnes is going to fire a live round during their wedding, which should be happening in the backyard. This should cause, cause everyone to panic and run towards the front gate. A 24-man attack team will get inside the mansion grounds by ramming the gate with a car bomb. This team will act as a diversion for Iron Man. They are all equipped with an EMP grenade that should theoretically slow him down, if not wholly stopping him. It doesn't matter if it works or not since they only need to hold Stark up front, while Sergeant Barnes extracts his wife-to-be. It's game over from there. Pierce walked back towards the operator monitoring the Winter Soldier with Strucker following not far behind. It looked like Barnes had already found his sniper nest since he was already looking down the scope. 
It was a shame that they hadn't implanted the Winter Soldier with their experimental cybernetic eye with a camera feed. They still couldn't figure out how to increase the battery life, but it was good enough to enhance the user's ocular abilities for at least three hours. They could also see what he sees, which was definitely a plus. It looks like they already started. When is he going to take the shot? Pierce asked. I don't know. Strucker answered nonchalantly. I just ordered him to cause a commotion that will push them towards the front. It's his judgment when he starts. Pierce nodded and just stared back at the monitor. It took a few minutes before the Winter Soldier loaded around. It looks like he's about to start. Pierce let out. A few seconds later, the Winter Soldier took his shot, but they saw an unexpected thing. They couldn't see it clearly due to the distance, but they saw one of the groomsmen looking towards Barnes and then diving for the couple. This, of course, surprised the pair since Barnes was a good one and a half kilometers away. There's an enhanced with him. Pierce started his observation before turning towards Strucker. Did you know about it? No. Strucker admitted while assessing the current situation. The plan hinges on Tony Stark getting distracted by the diver diversion team, while Barnes took Virginia Potts. Of course, there was an order to take the suit Stark would use if possible. However, with an enhanced, that has heightened senses, and with Stark, the plan might just fail. But we still have the Winter Soldier that can deal with him. What can enhanced senses do to a super soldier? Pierce stared at Strucker incredulously. Enhanced senses? That's more than enhanced senses. Pierce countered. The guy has more than enhanced senses. He also has increased speed and reaction time if he was able to move pots away. You better hope this plan of yours doesn't get tracked to us. He added, unknowingly, that a certain Jinchuriki had already figured out that it was them who sent the Winter Soldier. Stark Mansion, Long Island, New York. December 16th, 2009, 2145H Local. Every one of the guests was currently in the wine cellar in the basement. The basement had two exits and both them were on the same side of the room, so Naruto, Rodi, and Happy could easily guard the place. In case the assholes outside managed to work their way into the room, they could still move to the other exit as Naruto would hold back the enemies while not revealing anything special. Tony would be the one dealing with the assault team. Naruto could see the EMP grenades using his shinigan and smirked. Hydra really underestimated Tony's obsessive nature to fix any problem that he had with his tech. One of the first things Tony added to his suit was EMP shields. Naruto looked around the room and approved of the situation. Since every one of their guests was family and close friends, nobody was getting hysterical and panicking. Afraid? Sure. Who wouldn't in this situation? But they believed that Tony could handle the guys outside, while Rhodey and Happy could protect them. Tony will be all right. Those guys are easy pickings compared to what he had already been through. Naruto told Pepper when he saw her worrying about Tony. She was holding on to Morgan, to Morgan while sitting on a chair. Besides, he knew what was at stake if he failed. He will not back down even against a god. That's what I'm afraid of. Pepper confessed in a whisper while brushing Morgan's hair. Tony forgets his limit sometimes and bites off more than he can chew. I can say for sure that Tony will not die today. Those guys outside aren't coming for him. Naruto replied before staring straight into Pepper's eyes. They are coming for you. Jonathan, Victoria, Rhodey, and Happy heard Naruto's assertion while Morgan just ignored it and just leaned into Pepper. Naruto discreetly activated a surveillance disruption seal that would prevent anyone else from listening in on their conversation. It made it look like they were just talking silently or anything inconsequential to anyone outside, depending on the receiver. What do you mean they are coming for my daughter? Who are you anyway? Jonathan asked. 
He knew that the guy was close to Tony since he was one of his groomsmen, but Jonathan had no other details. Me? I'm Nathan Umber, Tony's intern slash boarder and Morgan's bodyguard. Naruto introduced himself. He, of course, used his alias. Anyway, there's a guy working his way to the mansion, and I'm fairly certain they are going for Pepper or Morgan to use them as leverage. Rody got a dangerous glint in his eyes and started walking towards the exit. What are you doing? Going after the son of a gun before he arrives. Rody replied, replied, amending his statement since Morgan was still there. Ha! That guy would eat you for breakfast even if you take happy with you. Naruto answered back. You know the guy? Rody asked. Yeah. Met him on a few jobs. Always had him scurrying away though I never tried to finish him off for reasons I can't divulge. Naruto responded. As for his description, let's just say he's a cyborg, Captain America. Rody cursed under his breath. If Naruto was saying that the asshole going after Pepper was someone like Captain America, then it really must be a super soldier no matter how unlikely it was. Even General Ross's attempt on recreating the super soldier serum ended in failure, and they supposedly had one of the smartest guys of this generation. That also means that there was someone powerful who wanted Tony's suit. Met him on a few jobs? Finish him off? What kind of intern or bodyguard are you? Jonathan said incredulously. The special kind. Naruto replied with a grin. I'm going to meet the guy. You can handle things here, right? Yeah. Rody confidently confirmed. They picked up weapons on their way to the basement. Rody was now holding onto an AR-15, Happy was using a 12-gauge semi-auto shotgun, while Jonathan had a Beretta handgun. Naruto gave the room one last look to confirm that everyone was fine before walking up the stairs, heading straight to the brainwashed super soldier. He activated his shinigan to look for his target, but not before looking in on how Tony was doing. It seems like Tony was making short work of the assault team, and they were slowly starting to retreat, when the EMP grenades didn't work. Naruto found the Winter Soldier jogging through the backyard, while carrying an assault rifle. He decided to just meet him halfway, and walked towards the back door, but not before slightly changing his appearance and the shade of his hair. Just as Naruto had planned, Barnes breached the mansion's door at the same time he arrived. That's not nice. Can't you just knock? Naruto commented jokingly. The Winter Soldier just stared at him while tilting his head. A beat later, he attacked Naruto with a barrage of bullets while walking towards him. Naruto decided to play along since Barnes had a camera strapped to him, so he hid behind a pillar and let him finish the whole clip. After 31 shots were fired, Naruto peeked around the pillar and saw the Winter Soldier rushing him. Barnes pulled his hand back and punched Naruto with his metal arm, fully expecting that it would completely demolish the guy in front of him. That was why he was surprised when Naruto nonchalantly caught the punch that could obliterate a concrete wall. Naruto dropped low to the ground and launched a kick to Barnes' abdomen, only releasing the metal arm when the Winter Soldier started flying through the air back out of the door. Of course, Naruto followed out of the door, expecting an exciting fight ahead. 